All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Kirby from the Golf Association of Philadelphia. I'm the director of competitions. Uh, happy that you all could join us this morning for uh, this golf course marking webinar. I am going to put everyone on mute uh, just in case you haven't already muted yourself just to stop the background noise during the presentation. If you have a question, I encourage you to use the uh, type a question area or one of our staff members will be uh, watching that monitoring the typed questions and we'll forward that uh, question to David uh, during the presentation um, and he'll uh, he'll answer the question while we're talk while while the presentation is going on so uh, again well going to mute everybody use the question tab uh, thanks for joining us and I'm going to turn it over to David Stabler who is the uh, Director of Rules Education for the USGA uh, to say that he's been involved in a, in a few course markings in his lifetime would be uh, uh, erroneous. It's probably been thousands. Uh, so we welcome him here this morning to teach us a little bit about uh, about the tricks of the trade. Thanks, David. Thanks, Kirby, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about about course marking this morning, and I don't know if I've marked a thousand courses, but with the shoes and the pants that I own, it probably looks like I have. Uh, one of the things I'll just say right from the very beginning, as we talk about how the rules of golf changed since January 1st of 2019, and, and how that's impacting things like golf course setup and marking and a little bit of maintenance, is that there's no one right way to mark a golf course or set up a golf course. The way you mark a golf course and set up a golf course is really comes down to who your customers are, who your players are. What are the expectations of those players? If you're marking a golf course for a U.S. Open, that's one thing. I, I've, I've been in many of our championships where a superintendent or a pro has come up and said, oh, I, I, we really want to see how you mark the golf course. Uh, because we want to know the right way to do it. And I have to have this conversation with them. I said, you know, we're marking this for the U.S. Junior Championship. We're marking this for the Mid-Am, for the U.S. Amateur, for the U.S. Open. That that doesn't mean that we're necessarily marking it correctly or setting it up correctly for your members day in and day out. So there are many right ways to mark a golf course. There are some clearly wrong ways to do it, but there are many right ways to do it as well. So let's talk a little bit about the art and some of the science of it as well. Uh, just an overview of, of what I want to talk about here today. Uh, just, you know, kind of some of the goals of the changes. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about terminology because that's important, what the five areas of the golf course are. And then I want to delve into certain parts of the golf course and certain types of, of things that, that happen and, and will affect your markings. First and foremost, the goals behind the changes to the rules of golf was one, to make them easier to read and understand, was to try to simplify rules and procedures wherever possible, try to relax a number of requirements and reduce penalties, speed up play, and provide more flexibility in golf course marking and setup and local rules. Now, with all of that said, did we make the rules of golf easier to read? No, we made them easier to read, but the rules are complicated. And there's a demand of golfers to have an answer for every obscure possible question you could you could ask and have a fair answer for it. And, and you can't have simple and fair. And so there's a balancing act that goes on with all of this. So uh, are the are the procedures and the rules simplified? Yes, uh, well, no, they weren't simplified. They were simplified where possible, but are they simple? No, uh, because again, this is a, so many things can happen on a golf course. Uh, there are just a zillion things that can go on out there. And again, we need an answer for everything. Relax requirements and reduce penalties. There's certainly a lot of that, and you'll see a bunch of that in the presentation I'm gonna give you today. Did everything that we do with the new rules speed up play? No, but we made it possible to speed up play in many more ways. And finally, set up in local rules, uh, a bunch of stuff. Let me start by just telling you a story about that a, a mentor of mine, Lou Blakey, a, a 
man who probably the man who's forgotten more about the rules of golf than I'll ever know. He said, you know, being the United States Golf Association and being the RNA, the, the people that write and interpret the rules of golf, you're you're the drum major of a marching band. You're trying to lead golfers and and get a rule set together that Okay, do you have me back? Yep, you're good now, David. Okay, thanks. Uh, so he talked about the, the USGA and the RNA being the, the drum major of the marching band. He said, but one of the important things that the drum major has to do from time to time, other than stride out in front and, and lead people, is occasionally turn around and make sure that the band is behind you. And in some significant ways, the band wasn't behind us when it came to how golf courses were marking then water hazards. Now we call them penalty areas. Uh, it, it certainly was not the case that golfers were observing stroke and distance when they hit a ball out of bounds or lost a ball. And there were many cases where, the, uh, the, where there were people who were organizing golf competitions and we're putting codes of conduct into place where they were putting golf penalties, assigning golf penalties with codes of conduct. And none of these things were supported by the previous rule set before 2019. And all of these types of things now are supported by the new rules of golf. There's much more flexibility in what you can mark as a penalty area much more flexibility in terms of stroke and distance with the alternative to stroke and distance. And where it's important, and this happens uh, very often in junior events is with where many, much of the pressure came from codes of conduct. Yes, you can now assign one and two stroke penalties to various types of conduct instead of just having to go right to a disqualification. So the new rules certainly uh, the drum major did turn around, look at where the band was, and repositioned where the drum major was standing in order to to uh, try to lead in a in a way that golfers wanted to be led. Terminology. I said one of the things that we tried to do was simplify the rules of golf where we could, and uh, it's ironic that in quote, simplifying the rules, we used to have four areas of the golf course, and now we have five. And why? Well, I'll talk about that in a second here. But there are five different ways that the golf course divides up. And many of you know this already. When I ask you what you're allowed to do in a bunker, most people are going to tell me, well, you're not allowed to ground your club or take practice swings in a bunker. Well, how about in the fairway? Yeah, I can do that in the fairway. Okay. How about... Uh, you know, uh, what about uh, what about in the penalty area? What are you what are you aren't you allowed to do? What what are you allowed to do in the in the teeing area that you aren't allowed to do anywhere else? Where I can tee my ball up and I can step behind it and I can do all sorts of stuff in the teeing area that I can't do everywhere else. So people know the know these differences when they're there. Putting green, you're allowed to mark and lift your ball anytime you want to. Can you do that anywhere else on the golf course? Well, no. So most people know all of this stuff, but let's talk about the terminology here. Five areas of the course where your ball can lie, and they affect your options when you play. And they also affect how, how you maintain uh, the challenge of playing the golf course. So let's look at these five areas. Golf course is divided into five areas. The biggest part of the golf course is what we call the general area. It's the fairway, it's the rough, it's the trees, it's the everything except the four other designated out special areas of the golf course. Let's look at those four. And you got special privileges and restrictions in those four areas. And the general, the general prohibitions that we know about everywhere on the golf course, which apply in the general area as well. So the first of those special areas is where you start every hole. It's the teeing area. And that teeing area isn't all of this area 
where you mow it to put T markers. The teeing area is just the area between the two T markers, the color of which you're playing today, and up to two club lengths behind the front edge of those teeing of those T markers. All right. This is where the player must, this is the teeing area. This is where the player who's playing must start every hole. If you're playing the white T markers, you're starting from that white box, not the blue one, not the red one, not the orange one, et cetera. And the teeing area is not all of this area that is maintained for teeing areas. It's just that one little rectangle that's there. So teeing area. And you've got all kinds of special privileges in there. The, the, the main one, though, is that you can tee the golf ball. And an interesting little historical reference here was that uh, in the beginnings of golf, you hold out and initially you teed up within about two club lengths of where you had just holed out. Now imagine how chopped up that must have been right near the hole. And one of the things that after a while, when they separated out a teeing area, it wasn't always in the nicest place of the golf course, but one of the things that they wanted to guarantee you when you started a hole was that you'd have a good lie. And that's where initially getting a handful of wet sand and putting it down in the teeing area and, 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 and putting it up into a little pyramid and putting your ball on top of it, that's where that came from and eventually led to the development of, a, of golf tees and so on. It was a way of guaranteeing you whatever lie you wanted when you started a hole. So there we are, the teeing area, a very special area on the golf course. All the other teeing locations on the golf course, when you're starting from, let me get my little marker out here. You know, when you're starting from this teeing area right here, all the other teeing areas on the golf course are you don't have any of those special privileges even the white tees on the next hole that you're going to play from up here you don't have any of those special privileges that you have from this teeing area right now in playing this hole these areas are all part of the general area when you're playing this hole and you only get those special privileges for this teeing area right here next of the special areas on the golf course are bunkers. I think we all know what bunkers are. Hollows typically you've where turf and soil has been removed and replaced with sand or the like, whatever. And in the new rules, they've been very specific about these are areas intended to test a player's ability to play a ball from sand. First time we've ever said that exactly in the rules. Probably the least friendly area of the golf course because you're not allowed to ground your club, you're not allowed to pr take practice swings and so on. It's a bit of a mystery what you're hitting down there from the sand. In terms of what the rules mean by sand, it includes any material similar to sand. Why, why, why they, they reference crushed shells, I don't know. I don't think I've seen many bunkers that have crushed shells in them, but I've seen lots of bunkers that have, um, uh, that have um, I believe it's called crushed limestone, which is very much like sand, etc. And any soil that happens to be mixed in with the sand. In, in terms of the new rules, your ball is in a bunker when it touches sand in that area. The, the, sand, the bunker itself is from the top of the sand to the bottom of the sand and along the edges of the sand area. So you can see that edge running right around here like so. The third of the four special areas of the golf course or penalty areas. Well, what are penalty areas? We'll listen to a little video here, and I hope that this buffers through for all of you.
like taking off time to the little uh, points of it. I mean, this change is really all about giving some flexibility to the committee when it comes to defining the golf course. But because we are going to see more red line, there's now the opportunity for players to find their balls in more situations. You know, similar to this, if my ball is there, I may well want to play it. Right? Under the current rules, there are a number of things I can't do. I can't run my club or go close together. All those things from 2019 is part of the rules modernization issue. Those go away as well. So if a player wants to play their ball, you're now going to have the ability to, to do some things that today they wouldn't allow for. Again, I think just offering that flexibility to the player, you know, play the ball as it lies, you can do all these things, or you can take relief under penalty one stroke. I think that's all important. It is important to um, um, a key element, a uh, key theme throughout the modernization process was trying to speed the game up. And, and we think that, that these changes in and around penalty areas will do just that. A wonderful game, just that little bit quicker, therefore, that could be better. Hey, David, that was a little bit choppy if you wanted to just uh, clarify that video just a bit for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope that you all were able to to hear the audio. I'm, I'm not sure. I see that it's buffered through for 98% of you at this point. And uh, well, as we go through, we'll talk a little bit more about penalty areas and try to clarify that a bit. And the last of those four areas, the putting green. And that's the one that the player is playing. Well, here we go again. We're going to try again with a video just to show a couple of things that are new to, in the rules of golf since 2019. Uh, we've always been allowed to repair ball marks and old hole plugs, but now it's been expanded tremendously to repair any other kind of damage on the putting green. Okay, and once again, I see it's buffered through for most of you. You saw the, the damage of foot marks and so forth. Uh, just for superintendents, uh, one of the things that is exempted from this is that you're not allowed to try to fix airification holes. And obviously, one of the reasons that you punch airification holes is to keep them open for a little while to get oxygen down into the, the profile. So that's one of the things that's not permitted in terms of repair. Well, there are the five areas of the golf course, and we'll be talking about them uh, as we go through. I'm going to first start with penalty areas. Penalty areas are bodies of water. Any body of water must be marked as a penalty area, and there's nothing new there in the rules of golf. But what's new is that other areas can be marked as penalty areas. And so anything that you want to put a red line around and allow players for one penalty stroke who've hit their ball into that circle to be able to take their ball out for one penalty stroke and drop it somewhere outside, you're allowed to do that. So if you've got areas that are uh, uh, large unmaintained areas of tall grasses where balls are typically, if they're found, they're not playable and typically they're not found, you can mark those as penalty areas. If you've got thick woods, you can mark those areas as penalty areas, just put a red line around them, and it's going to allow players to take a penalty relief outside of them without actually having to find their golf ball. If you do find your ball inside a red penalty area, you can play it or you can take relief. But in order to take relief outside the penalty area, all you have to have is what we call virtual certainty that it's in there, which is... 95% sure that it went in. All right, so you don't have to find it. You either have to know it's in there 100% or be 95% certain that it's in there. Well, we're going to look at some of the relief options. We're going to look at one of the relief options that was in the prior rules. The opposite edge relief has been eliminated. 
and what to think about between marking penalty areas as red versus yellow, and when to use this opposite edge relief, which is now available through a local rule, through a model local rule. So again, what are penalty areas? They're, they're bodies of water. So any, any body of water, whether it's got water in it or not right now, if, it is, if it's a water course in any sort of way that's supposed to be marked as a penalty area, and then other areas that the committee wants to define by putting a red line around and allowing relief, uh, like this wooded area over on the right, where typically balls are not found or when they are found unable to be played, you can mark those as red penalty areas. And I think many golf courses, even in the Philadelphia area, have been doing that for years in really in contravention of the rules of golf. And now the rules of golf have embraced the ability to do this. These areas can be marked either as red or yellow, and this affects the options that a player has. So let's look at the options. Here's a player who's played a tee shot and hit it into a pond. And there are three options if the pond is marked as a red penalty area, but only two if it's marked as a yellow penalty area. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we dig in. So the first of the options that you have when you hit your ball into a penalty area for one penalty stroke, if you choose not to play it or if you can't play it or can't find it, because you can always do that for no penalty. But if you're going to take the ball out of the penalty area, your first choice, the one that people most almost never use and don't want to do, is go all the way back to the spot where they previously played from. And depending on where the previously played from is, you have different procedures. If you're going back to the teeing area, anything that you could do when you teed off in the first place, you can do again, including teeing the ball. And we get a lot of questions about this at Golf House, that if I didn't use a tee for my first shot, uh, am I allowed to use a tee for my second shot or am I prohibited from using a tee and teeing the ball for my second shot? And the answer is you can do whatever you want. Whatever you're allowed to do in the teeing area, you're allowed to do. If you're going back to the general area or to a bunker or to a putting green, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, or to a penalty area, so, yeah, so here we are in a bunker. We don't see a penalty area, I think, on this on this map, but whatever. Is you go to the spot where your previous stroke was played from, that would be right here, and then you have a one club length relief area. I like to say a club length west, a club length east, and a club length south of where you're going. And this half circle is where you must drop your ball and play it. If you played from a bunker, you have that same area, but you're confined to the bunker, dropping it from knee height. So it doesn't plug like it used to plug or the same thing in a penalty area. You've got that one club length area. And in the odd case where you're playing under stroke and distance and your previous stroke was on the putting green, I saw Tiger Woods do that in a master's tournament once on the 13th hole. He had a long putt from the back of the green and putted down to the front and putted into the creek and decided to play again under stroke and distance from the putting green and you place the ball at that spot. So there's how you play under stroke and distance. The second option is what we call back on the line relief. This is the only other option when a penalty area is yellow, but it's available for red and yellow. And this is an option in which the player is still forced to confront the penalty area that they played from. In other words, they can't eliminate it by dropping on this side of the penalty area. They have to go behind the penalty area and drop. So you can see that the ball, the tee shot that was played, find my little mouse again, there we go. The tee shot was played and it crossed into the penalty area right here. You then set up a straight line from the hole through that spot, and you can drop, you choose a reference point somewhere on this penalty area, and this is up to you. You could choose it back here. You could choose it way up here, and you get to drop within one club length. Again, west. This player doesn't quite have a club length east. I come out to about here, and south and around there. So you can slide this up or down. You can go as far back as you want. 
or as close as you want, but you have to keep the penalty area between you and the hole. That's back on the line relief. You can see this here. In this case, this is probably and should be marked as a yellow penalty area. So we probably would see a yellow line somewhere up here. And if your ball entered right where that arrow is, then you're gonna make your straight line, your reference line from the hole through there and back and choose a spot and drop. When taking relief from a penalty area for one penalty stroke, what is the first option the 2019 rules is going half of a line? Don't step. the edge of the penalty area ball last crossed as it went in. They got to a straight line right through the hole. That's an estimated point. Standing behind the penalty area. Okay, I think that's buffered through for just about everybody. And then the final procedure, and this is the one that most golfers use, and this is the one golfers think you're always allowed to use when your ball is in a penalty area, which is not true. It's only allowable in a red penalty area, and that's lateral relief. This is the place where the ball crossed into the penalty area, right here, that dot, and you measure up to two club lengths outside and behind and not near the hole and that is your relief area in which you're going to drop the ball and play the ball from Measure or estimate your two club lengths relief area outside the penalty area that is not near at all. In the 2019 rules, club lengths are the length of the ball. A drop ball must land in the net with your rest in the area. What's been eliminated as a default option in the new rules is this opposite edge relief. So let's talk a little bit about some of the strategies for whether you mark a penalty area red or yellow. In this case, we've got a ball which is played from back here somewhere and it's gone down, crossed into the penalty area at this X right at that spot there and has come to rest here. Player can go back to the spot where they played their previous stroke. And remember, if this is in the general area, you get one club length this way, one club length that way and behind. And you drop and play the ball from here. So there would be your stroke and distance option. Your second option would be back on the line, and it's not coming back on this line that you flew into the penalty area on. Remember, your ball crossed here, and it's lining up the flag, the hole, and there, so that in this case, you're going to see if we transpose it here, that line is going to come back this way. Those are the two options for a yellow penalty area. Yellow means that we're not going to allow you to, by in taking one stroke penalty relief, take this penalty area out of play and play from over here somewhere. That's not going to be permitted when it's yellow. And if it's important in the strategy of playing a hole that somebody fully negotiate this penalty area and not be able with a penalty stroke to just take it out of play, then you want to mark it yellow. 
when a penalty area is marked red, and here we have the same hole marked red, well, look what you can do. Obviously, if you played your previous stroke from back here, you can come back under stroke and distance and drop within one club length of that. That's pretty ugly. You can go back on the line and remember that the ball, we're not using the line that the ball flew on, but we're using the line to figure out that crossing point and then building a new line from here through the crossing point. And you can go as far back or as close as you want for your one club length dropping area, relief area. And then finally is the lateral relief option where you're gonna drop the ball within two club lengths, not nearer the hole than where it crossed into the penalty area. What's been eliminated in the new rules is the automatic use of opposite edge. So we had a player who crossed right here and there's a spot on the opposite edge that's the same distance from the hole and that opposite edge relief would allow this player to essentially take the penalty area away, eliminate it. And so that option has been eliminated as a default option in the new rules, but it is allowable under model local rules and we'll show you some strategies for why you might want to do that. So not okay in the new rules, been eliminated. All right, we're going to show you something a little bit different now. And here's a player who's hit the ball and it's bounced on the far side of the pond and come back in. If it's yellow, you don't get to drop up here. Yellow means we want you to fully negotiate this penalty area, this pond. And if you haven't done it, you need to go back in some fashion. So stroke and distance, if you played from here, there would be your reference point. It'd be your one club length east and west and south, and your relief area would be there. Or use the back on the line procedure to create a reference line and choose a spot somewhere back there. So if it's important that if somebody flies it over a pond and goes back in, that you not allow somebody to play from the putting green side, you mark the penalty area yellow. This hey, David, got a question here for you. Sure. Um, it's from Mr. Stephen Kay. Uh, with a yellow penalty area, if the golfer had first hit over the green, then his next shot into the water, uh, yellow area. I guess he's, he's asking for an example on that. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Okay. So Stephen asks, a player hits a ball uh, over the green, then plays from here. It comes down and crosses and goes into the penalty area here, right? So there would be where the X is. Where do you play from next? Well, if you're going to use the back on the line procedure, it's from the hole through the X and the line goes back this way. And so you've got to play from somewhere, you've got to choose somewhere back here. This now all changes if you mark this penalty area red. Yes, this player still playing back on the line would go back behind the penalty area, but this player would also have the two club length lateral area available to essentially take the pond out of play. So if that's the option that you wanna give a player on a pond, on a creek, whatever, you may do so. It's all I, about what you want the strategy to be. Got another question here for you. Um, can you have a drop zone for both red and yellow marked areas? Can you have a drop zone? So that's, that's a, that is an option. Uh, having a drop zone is, is also an option. So it would be a third option for a yellow penalty area or a fourth option for a red penalty area. This is the, uh, the 15th hole at the Augusta National Golf Club where we didn't play the Masters last week. And they use a drop zone on this hole. And I believe that that drop zone is somewhere over here. And for one penalty stroke, that would also be an option. And that can be used on either red or yellow. 
And a follow up on that, um, someone asked, couldn't the player play from where the previous shot was played in from in the question asked? You always have the option, here it is, you always have the option to play under stroke and distance. So you can always go back here, or if we go back even uh, one further, the player who played down into here from behind the putting green could always under stroke and distance go back and play from a relief area one club length back here. Here's a little video that talks about why you might want to use the opposite edge local rule as as a as a as a possibility under in certain circumstances. So let's take a listen to this. I'm out of the fourth hole at Edward Edge Club, which features the red pedal area running up the left side of the hole before crossing over the barrel. If a player sticks into this red penalty area, the rule gives the player two options to drop either And I see this video is buffering a little bit slowly, but there we are. And I'll leave those three up there. That's my colleague in the rules department, Catherine Belanger. She's been with us for six years. And if you ever get an opportunity to go to one of our rules of golf workshops and she's teaching, she's an excellent teacher. I would highly recommend her. Got one more question here for you, David. Um... What happens if your two club length drop area from lateral relief does not afford you an area that is not closer to the hole? This is a very good question. And the answer is just because it's an option in the rule book doesn't mean that it presents itself in reality. Uh, if we go back to, um, uh, if we go back to to this situation, uh, this is a heavily wooded area, and in many cases, it's not even worth trying. Or you might even find a situation sometimes where you've got out of bounds running down the side of a hole like this, and that back on the line relief area would take you straight out of bounds. So you just don't have that option. The same thing would happen when it's when it's uh, lateral relief or or something. You can see in this case. Uh, there's just a little sliver of pie here. Usually you're going to get something, but if the perfect storm happens and there's nowhere nearer the hole, then you just don't have that option. And when that is something that could happen to players, especially with the lateral option, with the two club length option, it's a very good idea for the golf course to maybe think about or consider having a dropping zone so that you do afford a player an option that they should have when the regular option just doesn't work properly. This can also happen with back on the line relief. Here's another example of why you might want to use this opposite edge local rule. You can see this in Florida golf courses a lot where you've got out of bounds, you've got houses over here to the right, and it's out of bounds on the edge of the penalty area. A player pushes a ball, just biting off maybe a little bit more than they should have tried to bite off, and their ball winds up in the penalty area. Well, there's nowhere to drop the ball over here because it's all out of bounds. Two club lengths just doesn't do you any good over here. You can't use that option. And so the opposite edge model local rule would be a very good local rule to put into effect 
in a situation like this. Switching gears, we'll talk, let's talk a little bit about free relief areas. Uh, we have things we call abnormal course conditions, that's ground under repair, immovable obstructions like cart paths and sprinkler heads, et cetera. Temporary water, we used to call it casual water. Uh, one of my great uh, 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 sadnesses is that changing from casual water to temporary water, we lost my favorite Spanish translation of a term of all of them. A casual water used to be called um, agua occasional. Well, we lost that. Too bad. And animal holes. So those are abnormal course conditions. We'll talk a little about wrong greens and embedded balls and dangerous animals also. So those are all the free relief areas that you get under the rules of golf. Hey, David. So these four conditions. Yeah. Hey, this is Kirby. I just had somebody text me a question. I think it's uh, two good questions, actually. Um, so I wanted to share them. Um, the first one is you can the committee can make the choice of making a penalty area whatever color they want. And the second question is where can you uh, put the drop zone? Could it be on the other side of the penalty area? So under the new rules, one of the things that the rules have always said is that the committee is the final authority. The committee's decision is final. And in the new rules, we've been very forthright with this, that the committee, the committee can do what it wants. In the past, we've, we've and we still discourage marking bodies of water that you must cross in order to get to your final goal, the putting green in the hole. We discourage those from being from being marked red rather than yellow when it's important that you don't allow somebody who has crossed it and come back in to play from the putting green side. But now we've really turned that decision over to the committee, taking away the opposite edge default option makes it uh, much more difficult for somebody to hit it into a red penalty area and get to the putting green side if they haven't gotten there in the first in the first place so you can mark whatever color you want and under the new rules having taken the opposite edge option out as a default option means that you can mark many more penalty areas red uh, i'm a member at rolling green golf club and we used to have three different penalty areas on three different holes on seven, eight, and 13 marked as yellow penalty areas. And we've marked them all red now. And that is because they're most, none of them are up by the putting green for one thing, and there's not a huge amount of, of, um, of, of gain by, by marking them red. And typically you're not going to, in any of those particular penalty areas, you're not gonna hit the ball over them and come back in. So we've marked everything at Rolling Green red now. And I don't think that we've lost, we've lost anything in that regard. As far as where can you put a dropping zone? You can put a dropping zone anywhere you want. Again, we discourage, uh, th there's, there's this, kind of thing that I've, I've seen at a lot of clubs. I think it's unfortunate when it's not possible for players of every ability to play the game kind of as the rules designed them to be played. And when you have a forced carry that some players who can't hit the ball very far can't negotiate, I really find that to be a golf course design issue more than I find it to be a rules of golf issue. Uh, you know, can't you squeeze a tee somewhere over on the side or a dropping zone somewhere on the side where you could at least have somebody cross a little bit of this penalty area to do that. But if, if you have to and you want to, again, you're marking the golf course for your customers, for your, for your consumers out there, uh, that uh, if you want to put a dropping zone on the putting green side of a penalty area, the rules of golf do not prohibit you from doing that. Don't ever expect to see it happen in the U.S. Open or the PGA, the British Open, or the Masters.
Okay, let's back to this free relief stuff. Abnormal course condition are those four things. You can see pictures of them. Relief is always, well, I should say almost always optional from all of these areas, uh, unless an area of ground under repair or uh, an immovable obstruction area has been designated to be a no play zone. Let's just talk a little bit about no play zones. Uh, and that is that uh, in each of these situations, uh, you're you're not going to be allowed to play your balls at lies. So you have a decorative planting area and you've decided it's ground under repair, no play zone. We used to call it ground under repair, mandatory relief. Now it's ground under repair, no play zone. If your ball is in there, you must take relief. But there's also going to be a situation in which your ball's not in there, but your stance or your swing might be interfered with by that no play zone, in which case you also must take relief. You're not going to be allowed to stand in there or hit anything in that no play zone. Wrong greens. Now, the yellow arrow is pointing to the putting green of the hole being played. And so the putting green. To the right is the is another hole on the golf course. The, the putting green immediately behind that on the right is a practice putting green, and the putting green over there on the left is a short game area. All of those are wrong greens, and the rules, they effectively are no play zones. You're not allowed to play a stroke from those greens. You must take relief. Out of bounds. Traditional stroke and distance penalty relief, but now the alternative to stroke and distance. We've seen this before. When stroke and distance is required, depending on where you're going back to, your procedure is different. I've never seen anybody hit a ball out of bounds when they played a stroke from a putting green, but just in case it ever happens, the rules of golf are prepared with an answer. So add one penalty stroke and your procedure depends on where you are. Let's look at the alternative to stroke and distance and I'll talk about some options and some questions that have come up with that. Okay, and looks like most of that has buffered in at this point. You can see when you use this alternative local rule for stroke and distance, uh, the player estimated that the ball was lost right somewhere around there. So there's two club lengths in this direction outside of that. There's two club lengths once you get to the fairway, two club lengths here. And it's a very, very large relief area. You could drop back here. You could drop over here, anywhere in this shaded area. But it gets you out to a fairway. Another look at this. Player's ball is estimated to be lost there at the where I'm putting the red dot. So we're going to draw two straight lines, one from the hole through there, one from the hole through the spot where this intersects the fairway, the same distance as where the ball is estimated to be lost. There are your two straight lines and you get two club lengths on either side of those straight lines in addition. So the ball can be dropped anywhere in here. When you hit a ball out of bounds, there's the spot where you crossed out of bounds same distance from the hole to the nearest edge of a fairway, and you measure 
you get two more club lengths going this way at that same distance from the hole and going back and you can drop anywhere in here. This is two penalty strokes. Let's just talk about this a little bit. If I play from here and hit a ball out of bounds and go back under traditional stroke and distance, I've played one stroke from here. I'm now gonna play a second stroke from here. And I have one penalty stroke, don't I? So that equals my ball lies three out here. If you use the alternative, you have one stroke which got you to here and two penalty strokes and you dropped the ball there and you lie three. So you either lie three after playing under traditional stroke and distance here or three here. So there's how that works. You get to the same place in both ways. Uh, at, at my club in Philadelphia, at Rolling Green, we, we have chosen to use the model local rule all of the time, except in important club competitions. We're not using it in the club championship. Uh, we're not using it in, in, in scratch play and, and in some important club net play. I don't think we're using it in the member member tournament, but when we have a best four ball, you know, a best two out of four, we use the alternative local rule. Um, Kirby, do you have any sense, or Chris, or Jason, about what percentage of, of GAP clubs are using the alternative uh, local rule? I don't have any estimation, but I would say it's relatively small, Dave, from what I've talked to people about. Okay. Uh, we do get a question about what if I hit the ball over the green and it goes out of bounds? So I've hit a shot here and I went out of bounds. How do I how do I do this? You know where where's my where's my fairway? What do I do? And the way this works when you hit a ball over the green is again you've got some distance that your ball went out of bounds from the hole from there to there, and you're going to swing around on that arc until you hit a fairway edge. Uh, I could swing around this way as well. And maybe I'd hit a fairway edge back here. You're going to hit, so you have to go to the nearer of the two. So that's how it works when you hit a ball over a green. You're just going to keep that arc and you're going to swing around and do the same type of thing. Or if you were to lose the ball back there. Okay, a little bit more on no play zones. It can be any penalty area, it can be a no play zone. In the past, it had to be somehow designated by a government authority as environmentally sensitive in order to be a no play zone. Uh, but uh, from, for those of you who have been to Bandon Dunes uh, and, and played, uh, played some of the holes that are along the cliff to the Pacific Ocean, Bandon Dunes has designated those cliff penalty areas as no play zones. It's just smart. It's just flat out safety, They're keeping keeping people from climbing down into them and falling down into that thorny gorse and so forth. So you can mark any penalty area you wish or any part of a penalty area you wish now under the new rules as a no play zone. So if it's important for, uh, for what, whatever good reason, you can mark it as a no play zone. Any abnormal course condition can be marked as a no play zone. And again, the relief is required if your ball is in the no play zone. So in the penalty area, you must take one stroke penalty relief outside the penalty area. In an abnormal course condition, you must take relief outside or away from the penalty area. But also if your stance or your swing is, ref is interfered with by that no play zone. Now, interestingly enough, if your ball's outside of a penalty area, but your stance or swing would be in the penalty area or interfered with by the penalty area, you're gonna be able to take free relief because you're not in the penalty area to start with. You're gonna be able to take free relief and must take free relief so that you're not standing or hitting the penalty area, no play zone on your shot.
So a no play zone is a defined part of either an abnormal course condition or a penalty area. Okay. Must take relief if your ball is there, must take relief if stance or swing is interfered with when your ball isn't necessarily there. Okay. And the final kind of the final stuff I want to talk about is, is your toolkit of options. Uh, for that that are uh, much more expanded under the new rules and I want to give you as an example the practice area the practice short game area and practice uh, practice T at my club rolling green which parallels uh, the left side of our 13th hole and how do you deal with this because there are lots of golf balls in there we don't really want players going in here searching for their golf ball as players are hitting practice shots in this in this direction from the practice tee. So how do you deal with this area or an area like this? What are your options in golf course marking? Well, the one thing you can do is allow play from that area. Now, typically at Rolling Green, we don't get many balls that get over into that area that you're looking at right there. We, we get a little bit of this. We get it into these into these trees along here and we get it in the short game practice area. Our choice at Rolling Green has, has been to allow play from there. But if, if it were a little bit more dangerous, well, we've got some other possible things we can do. You can give, you can make the whole area ground under repair, no play zone, and allow free relief, or just ground under repair and allow people to take relief outside of the ground under repair, which would get them back somewhere. In this case, it would get the player back here and a nearest point of complete relief here and a nearest point of complete relief so they'd be playing from somewhere out in here i would imagine or you can make it a penalty area and require them to take a penalty stroke to get out of it or you can make it out of bounds and require them to play under stroke and distance so those are all of your toolkit options if you do allow either free relief or one stroke penalty relief you've got some sub options within that you can with free relief allow play because it's just optional relief or you can make it a no play zone where you would prohibit relief and force relief and you can do the same thing if it's a one stroke penalty relief if you decide to make it a penalty area if it's out of bounds you either play under stroke and distance or if you have the alternative local rule option in effect you allow players to do that. So in that case, if the optional local rule was in effect, this player would be using that spot, would be allowed to come out to the same distance from the hole as the edge of the fairway there. We've got our two straight lines, one from the from the hole here. This one's not very straight. This one's not very straight. You get the idea. You don't get two club lengths in that direction, but you get two club lengths into the fairway in this direction, so you get that little extra. And you would be allowed for two penalty strokes with the optional local rule to be dropping the ball anywhere within there. Bunkers. Bunkers versus waste bunkers and under repair and moving things and bunkers and the unplayable options. Let's look at this. Again, many, many more committee options available in, in the new rule. So we have this prepared area of sand, that's a bunker versus these natural areas. Uh, the committee, however, may define a non-prepared area as a bunker. That's what's done at Pine Valley. Uh, all sand at Pine Valley, I believe, is still considered bunker. But the default under the rules would be these prepared areas are bunkers. These natural areas are not bunkers, but the committee has vast options. If you remember with my practice uh, short game area at Rolling Green, the committee could decide this is a practice bunker. It's, it's not maintained in the same kind of way. It's got footprints in it all the time. You rake it before you play from it. The committee could decide that this bunker, if this is part of this ground under repair, is not a bunker, but is part of the general area. So that if you're in there, you'd be getting the same free relief outside if this was ground under repair that you would be getting otherwise. That's, that's one of the options that's allowed under this. In the new rules, anytime a bunker is completely under, under repair, 
then it gets treated as part of the general area. It's not a bunker anymore until it's fixed, until it's repaired. Again, bunkers are now under the new rules intended to test a player's ability to play from sand. And so things like loose impediments can be removed without penalty. And the same goes for penalty areas. You can move loose impediments without penalty. This is an interesting simplification in the rules. We haven't added to the rules by allowing you to move loose impediments in bunkers and penalty areas. We've just made loose impediments having the same status everywhere on the golf course. They can be moved. There aren't any restrictions in any areas anymore. Okay. And a new a new option for bunkers, and that is that if your ball is in a bunker, unless you played under stroke and distance in the past and your previous stroke was from outside the bunker, you couldn't get out of the bunker. Your back on the line option and your lateral option had to be taken in the bunker. Well, now there's a new two stroke penalty option where you can extend back on the line and take the ball out of the bunker. Let you drop from back on the line outside the bunker for a penalty of two strokes. Imagine a straight line running from the hole through where your unplayable ball is. I get my stop on that line as far behind the point as you like. Measure the one public I will be fair. Which side of the line is behind the sky? Drop the ball and return to the line. Or drop the ball first. And okay, that looks like it's buffered through for just about everybody. Finally, I want to talk just a little bit about model local rules, and there is a compendium of them in Section 8 of the Official Guide to the Rules of Golf. There are 76 entries for model local rules in that section. Instead of having them scattered previously in the appendix, in decisions, in just all over the books that we had in the past, they've all been compiled into this model local rule section in section eight. It doesn't mean that there are just 76 model local rules because within some of those entries are two or three options or variations of those rules. And let me just talk about a couple of the model local rules that are back there. We've already talked about the alternative to stroke and distance, that's model local rule E5. And we've talked about the opposite side relief in a penalty area. One that I didn't put in here, a silly me not to put in there, is the one for dropping zones in, in penalty areas. And the dropping zones uh, model local rule is E8, immovable obstructions close to putting greens. Uh, many of our golf courses have started to closely mow areas around putting greens, and this model local rule gives you relief if a sprinkler head or a drain is within two club lengths of the putting green, and your ball, which is lying off the putting green, is within two club lengths of that sprinkler head or drain and it's on your line of play that you would get free relief from that. So that immovable obstructions close to putting greens model local rule might be for you. The PGA Tour has this on their hard card, but they limit it, and I think this is generally a good idea, they limit it to the obstruction must be in an area that's mowed to fairway height or shorter, and your ball must also be in an area where the grass is mowed to fairway height or, sh or shorter because this is really about uh, allowing a player who is going to play the ball close to the ground by either putting it or chipping it very low to have the same kind of opportunity to play that shot regardless of whether there's a sprinkler head or a drain or some other type of obstruction in their way. Out of bounds when a public road 
uh, runs through the course. I think of Ardmore Avenue at Marion. And uh, unless you use this model local rule, if you were playing the first hole at Marion and knocked it over onto the 10th hole, you would be across out of bounds and back on the golf course and in bounds. Or if you were playing the uh, the 12th hole and knocked it over the green onto the 13th tee, you'd be in bounds. You can use this model local rule to say once you've crossed a public road that runs through the golf course, your ball is out of bounds regardless of where it lies. Ball deflected by power line. Model local rule for that. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, for those of you who have unfortunately have a lot of geese at your club, there's a model local rule that allows the player the option to either treat the the uh, the uh, goose dung in in my example as a loose impediment, which which it is by definition, or can treat a ball that has interference from that as ground under repair, which would allow you to lift and clean the ball or even substitute another ball and take relief. Model local rule F12. Concrete drainage channels. Uh, this is a model local rule that allows, uh, that allows for, um, uh, at, at some clubs, you've got these drainage channels. These things otherwise meet the definition of a penalty area and are supposed to be marked as penalty areas, but this model local rule would, be, would allow them to be treated as areas that are in the general area and are immovable obstructions from which you'd get free relief. Well, that concludes everything that I've prepared to talk about and turn it over and back to uh, Jason and Kirby if there are any questions at the end here. Hey, Dave, I've got one question uh, <clears throat> uh, loaded here. Um, for marking a no play zone, must signs or stakes always be used? If lines are used, what color should they be? This is an interesting question. I asked this, are we going to recommend a type of marking for these areas and, and got very little feedback as we were going through the, the new rules process. It's taken its, its, normal, its normal course. Uh, in the past, green topped stakes were something that indicated environmentally sensitive. And I think that a lot of golf courses have continued if if they have a penalty area that's marked no play to use the green top stakes but one of the things that is important is that players can't read the mind of the golf course or the committee and and you really do need to make it clear so uh, uh, I always I always ask people if they un if they know what PDR means PDR and the rules of golf and PDR means players don't read so you can put it on model local rule, you can put it on your local rule sheet and they probably won't read it. So posting a sign that says, you know, penalty area, no play zone, mandatory relief is a great idea. If you have a, a, a membership club, uh, you can probably pretty quickly or decently quickly uh, uh, train the members with green top stakes, but you should do something to make those areas different in some way and call out that they're not just a standard penalty area. David, I had a, another text here. Um, if there's no line around a penalty area, where does the penalty area start? Uh, the new rules actually give an answer to that. In the past, and there's a famous, uh, there's, there's a, there's a famous uh, uh, phone conversation that, that, uh, uh, the great uh, P.J. Boatwright, who was the rules of golf for a long time, uh, had with someone who called one day and said, hey, we're playing a golf course and the, uh, and the water hazards aren't marked. There are no lines. There are no stakes. What do we do? And P.J. said, well, you just have to cancel the competition. There's no answer. <laughs> well, the, the rules of golf now do provide an answer, and that is that when a penalty area is not marked in any way, it is by default a red penalty area, and the the edge of the penalty area is where the where the ground begins to break down to move down and into the penalty area. That, that's that's the best the rules can do. Uh, there's a uh, there's there's a pretty big hole you can drive a truck through there in terms of where that point is, but the rules at least give a default answer now. 
Got a couple questions flowing in here, David. Um, first one is for your USGA championships, where do you put penalty area stakes? On the line or outside the line? We put them on the line and with with many of the with the stakes that we get, uh, they are the square one and a half inch or two inch stakes that have a dowel on them. Uh, and, and we just push the dowel into the ground as so. I know that there are uh, you know, there's this there's this concern if you drive a stake into the ground and the stake becomes detached and it's on that red line, which is part of the penalty area. If a ball were to go into the hole that's made by the stake, well, you get no relief from a hole made by the maintenance staff when it's in a penalty area, which then leads many people to put those stakes outside of the penalty area. In our championships, we put them on the line. Uh, Mike Davis is a, is a firm believer in, I don't wanna confuse players as to where the penalty area is. Is it where the stakes are? Is it where the lines are? So he likes to have them all in the same place. And we try not to put many penalty stakes out either. Right. Uh, another one here. Um, with the no play zone in mind, what happens if someone knowingly or unknowingly plays from that area? They've played from a wrong place. Right. So they've got a two stroke penalty and stroke play or they've lost the hole in match play. And now you've got to make it you've got to make a decision as to whether where they played from gave them a significant advantage over where they were required to go in taking relief. Uh, think in terms of, of somebody who's playing from 175 yards from the hole in the no play zone, and they would have played from 179 yards outside the no play zone. I think the two stroke penalty probably takes care of that. You don't need to consider that a serious breach. But imagine another situation in which somebody is playing from the putting green side of a no play zone pond where they pitch the ball onto the green and they would have had to go back behind the pond and taking relief either under stroke and distance or back on the line and played from 60 or 100 or 150 yards. And maybe you do have a a serious breach in that case. But when you've played from a no play zone, you've, you have played from a wrong place. Right. And last one I have here is uh, it, just asking you to talk about how you would handle a bunker, bunker full of water and how to handle it on the day of a competition. Uh, uh, the rules, and I think there's a model local rule for this. Uh, yes, there you go. Bunker filled with temporary water, F16. And one of the things that you can do with a bunker filled with temporary water is declare it to be ground under repair and part of the general area so that it would now just become a ball in temporary water in the general area. And a question from our own Chris Rosell. Uh, do you put the rakes inside or outside the bunkers at USGA championships? We like to put them outside the bunkers in places where they're least likely to come into play. Of course, that works until the first player plays, and then the rake goes wherever it goes. Uh, after that, uh, there is a uh, uh, th there there's there's a reason to not put the rakes in. Bunkers. Well, let's put it this way. There's a reason not to put rakes in the very back parts of bunkers. Uh, and that is that were a ball to come to rest against a rake in the back part of a bunker, player's going to move the rake, the ball's going to move, and now they might not be able to replace the ball anywhere not nearer the hole where it'll come to rest. And if the only place they could put it would be nearer the hole. In which case the player wouldn't be allowed to play properly under the rules. They'd either play from a wrong place in the bunker for a two-stroke penalty and stroke play, or they'd have to take a two-stroke unplayable to get out of the bunker. So you can eliminate that problem by either putting the rakes outside the bunker or by putting the rakes anywhere in the bunker other than near the back where that problem could happen. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm actually out of questions that people have asked. Kirby, if you, I don't know if you have any others. That's it for me. Thanks, Appreciate everybody.
appreciate your time, David. We really appreciate you doing the seminar for us. Uh, hope everybody found it helpful and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, rainy Monday. And Thanks if anyone everyone. is interested in a recorded copy of the webinar, um, feel free to reach out to me personally, uh, Jason Funderberg, jfunderberg at gapgolf.org. Um, and I'd be more than happy to pass this along.